Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Executive Editor for Data Diversity. We would like to thank you for joining this month's installment of the monthly Data Diversity and DEMA International Webinar Series, Enterprise Data World. This webinar series is designed to give our Enterprise Data World conference attendees education year-round, and we are excited about the upcoming Enterprise Data World 2015 to be held in Washington, D.C., March 29th through April 3rd, just less than two weeks away. Very exciting. Today's webinar is being presented by a long Time well known EDW speakers Kelly O'Neill, founder and CEO of First San Francisco Partners, and Pam Thomas, Vice President of Consulting Services at IMQ Solutions. Today they will be discussing managing change for successful data governance. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them by the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights of questions via Twitter using hashtag EDW15. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me formally introduce today's speakers. Having worked with the software and systems providers to key to the formulation of master data management, Kelly O'Neill has played important roles in many of the groundbreaking initiatives that confirm the value of MDM to the enterprise. Recognizing an unmet need for clear guidance on the intricacies of implementing data solutions, she founded its first San Francisco partners. Under her leadership, uh, for San Francisco Partners immediately established a reputation as a first call resource for companies looking to tap the values of the value of enterprise information management, MDM, and data governance. Pam is a change management and organizational effectiveness practitioner with 30 years in consulting and executive leadership positions. A strong HR strategist, she is adept in aligning HR strategy with business strategy, as well as identifying and managing all of the elements necessary to affect change in organizations and drive business results through people. Her current role with IMQ Solutions, she delivers consulting services in the areas of change management strategy and planning and planning, change management project and program delivery, and coaching and mentoring leaders through organizational change. And with that, I will turn over the presentation to Kelly and Pam to get us started. Hello and welcome. Hi, Shannon. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you very much, Shannon. I just wanted to point out that Pam started managing change when she was nine years old. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Kelly. <laughs> because there's no way that she has been doing it for 30 years. Anyway, um, anyway, I hope everybody is doing really well today, and thank you so much for joining us. And we also hope that we will have an opportunity to meet many of you face-to-face -face at EDW. Um, this is a really exciting opportunity for me especially to partner with Pam because so much of the success of data governance has to do with the softer side, the people and the change associated with data governance. So it is really a critical success factor in implementing data governance. So hopefully we'll meet you all for the longer tutorial and it's on Monday. So shameless plug, but there you go. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well to get started, uh, we're going to go through uh, some definitional points to make sure that we have a agreement upon how we are looking at the scope of data governance and understanding the context of organizational change management. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how data governance uh, creates change in an organization, and we will wrap up with some very practical tips on managing change within a governance uh, discipline. So the whole purpose of this conversation today is to really understand some of the key factors for successful data governance implementation. So for those of you that have been uh, governing data uh, previously, we're, going, we're not going to be talking about policies and processes, we're not going to be talking about technology. Really, uh, true sustainable data governance and successful implementation relies solely on the people, and that's the focus that we're going to have today. So, Shannon, can you hear me okay? Okay, I'm just going to keep going. So, Shannon, interrupt me if, if the good. sound Sorry. quality is poor. Okay, yeah, you're not good. a problem. All right. 
So uh, we will do a quick uh, terminology review and uh, talk a little bit about those typical obstacles. So even though I can't see everybody in the audience, I'm hoping that when we start to go through these obstacles for change, I, there will be some virtual nodding going on. Um, and then we'll talk about how addressing uh, some of those change issues make for a successful implementation. Uh, so we will go back and forth between myself and Pam throughout this presentation. Uh, so uh, I'll get it kicked off and then uh, transition it over to Pam, but we will have the opportunity to uh, speak to each other's uh, points as we go through and, of course, looking forward to addressing everyone's questions at the end. All right. So just wanted to start off by defining data governance and just level setting a little bit about the perspective of data governance. So data governance is really an organizing framework for establishing the strategy and objectives that lead to available, usable, consistent, auditable, secure, and data with high integrity. So we talk about data governance as being an organizing framework because it is not a one-size-fits-all. So although this uh, discipline has matured quite a bit in the last few years, it still isn't a uh, something that is like an assembly line. And that's because the way that data is created and used within organizations is very different, even within the same industry. Now, there are some similarities across industries, across company cultures, et cetera, and that's why frameworks work very well for identifying the scope of data governance, the requirements of data governance, but it's not a specific one-size-fits-all implementation uh, approach. And if we do think about this as a framework that consists of policies, processes, organization, and technology, this is just by definition where you can start to see how governance actually, by nature of the uh, definition, starts to drive change. For example, if unless a company has grown up with a data governance discipline in place from the very beginning, Inherently, implementing data governance potentially means new policies and new processes and new technologies and new roles within a company. And it's very rare that uh, organizations really do focus on governance specifically as they grow uh, from a startup organization to a mature company. And those companies who have been in business for decades, potentially centuries, it becomes very obvious where if there's not a data discipline from the very beginning, as companies mature, that it can become more and more complex to start governance at a point in time, because inherently it just means change. And another aspect of this is it tends to be that point in which the technical audience who's focused on things like data standards and modeling uh, engages with the more business audience that focuses on communications and metrics and uh, the usage of data. This conversation and this bringing together of the different viewpoints is also potentially a new uh, consensus building and engagement process for a company that may not engage in this way in any other uh, in any other project or in any other program within the company. So just by definition, data governance drives a lot of change. So I think that that's one thing to uh, be very uh, aware of. Now, organizational change management, we wanted to call out here that organizational change management is not the definition of what is typically called change management, especially in a technical context. So we are talking about shifts in perspective activities and behavior within an organization and the people within that organization. We're not talking about change management as it pertains to technical changes, as it pertains to uh, upgrades or modifications of tools or technology. This is really organizational change management, looking at the way that companies work um, and the way that people are engaged within the company. Pam, did you want to add anything to that? Well, I would just say that um, I'll talk uh, a little bit more about this in a few minutes, 
but um, this idea of proactively identifying where your change issues are likely to occur really gives you a head start with understanding what you're going to do, need to do to get them addressed, um, particularly uh, with regard to like getting a sponsor on board or um, building a, chain of a team of people that are going to help you drive data governance change through the organization. Um, I think that uh, um, it's important to understand that issues are likely to occur, and the sooner that you can get on top of those and start building the communications and maybe even the training that you need um, helps you get people through the change faster and leads to data governance adoption more quickly. So like I said, I will, uh, I'll be covering that in a little more detail shortly. Great. Thanks, Pam. And I think that the main, um, one of the main things that we want to get across here is as you're planning for a data governance strategy, organizational change management should be included in that planning process. So for those of us that have been doing governance for a while, we're very comfortable having a technical roadmap to support data governance that includes things like data modeling standards and, and metadata management and data quality and master data management, et cetera. With as much focus as we put into that planning and that roadmapping process for technology, we should put an equal amount of planning into the organizational change management process. So spending just as much time doing that um, assessment in the beginning of where potential change could occur, as Pam mentioned, and planning for that change so that we don't get surprised by it uh, in the future. Okay, so having said that, now let's talk specifically about what are some of the things that drive change uh, with a data governance program or a data governance discipline. So, you know, it's funny when Pam and I were putting together this deck, actually this single slide I think started out as three different slides and it was really a big effort to consolidate it down to a single slide. And even in doing so, the notes that you don't see right now are still about three pages <laughs> because the reality is, is there's lots of things that create obstacles for data governance. Um, and what we've highlighted here are just a few of them. Uh, many times there's competing priorities and lack of resources within the company. Many of you have had an instance where you've uh, pulled together a a group of individuals that are very interested in instantiating data governance within an organization and addressing those data issues that are identified across the company and have started to make progress when all of a sudden some of your critical players are starting to get pulled into other projects. And that's a great example of how competing priorities pull resources and funding away from a long-term data governance initiative. Because data governance is inherently a long-term program, it's very easy to get distracted by the next shiny object. And most of us have probably had that experience where that has happened. Um, many times there's some territorial issues in the sense that there is either a very clear understanding of data ownership and people are very interested in their own data, but they fall into this, this concept of, I think Len Silverstein calls it the data mining, where it's my data and it's not your data. So there's this concept of ownership that's very tight and it's mine and I own it, and therefore it's also not yours. That creates just as much issue within an organization as nobody wanting to own the data. And people saying, yep, yep, not my responsibility. Nope, nope, that's somebody else's responsibility. So both extremes create an issue when you're trying to create accountability for quality of data. Um, as I mentioned before, sometimes having a conversation that includes representatives from across the business in a single conversation is an uncomfortable um, process for a company that has been very focused on success within a line of business and pulling together across those lines of business or across those business units is very difficult to do and in fact loses priority. So I'm not going to go through each of these um, in a lot of detail, but suffice to say that 
just about every one of these obstacles to data governance change really has its foundations in people and people's willingness to adopt data governance as an ongoing uh, practice and discipline within their organization. So you can see how in order to avoid these obstacles, or maybe not avoid, but plan for these obstacles to come up, it is necessary to look at what's going to happen when we start to institute governance and how are people going to be willing to adopt it or how might they start to push back because maybe they don't want the accountability or maybe they don't see the business justification that happens um, or maybe they're very nervous that they're going to lose their job and there's going to be a change in personnel as a result of it. So lots of, lots of people uh, issues associated with change. Now, many times people think about uh, data in the context of systems and technology. And so this might be preaching to the choir, but the reality is, is that the data and uh, software and hardware and the systems that house the data really aren't necessarily ob uh, obstacles to data governance change because you can govern data without a change in your systems um, many times. Sometimes you do need to change your systems, um, but sometimes you can just improve your data governance through people and process, and then complement that improvement within an improved state of infrastructure so that the infrastructure around tools, technology, software, hardware becomes a complement to the people and process side of data governance. But even when you start changing the infrastructure associated with uh, with managing data, still that drives change in an organization. People get very attached to their own systems, and if you're looking at changing the viewpoint of, say, a system of record, for example, that could make some people uncomfortable, and they may resist that change that is a system-oriented change more so than a process-oriented change. So that also brings up some change issues as well. So lots and lots of obstacles, which is why this is difficult. But we're all spending our time here today, this morning, and this afternoon, for those of you on the East Coast, because data governance is important. So there's uh, many external pressures that we thank to drive uh, greater discipline and uh, greater investment in data governance. We, the regulators are very good at uh, making sure that those industries like financial services and uh, pharmaceutical and healthcare uh, have these regulatory requirements that impact data. And for them, we are very thankful. Um, now that, that external pressure also comes in the form of customer requirements too, where uh, customers want to be able to interact with organizations in the same way, regardless of whether they are on the web, on their phone, um, uh, on their iPad versus their computer. So they want to be able to have a single interface with their provider and be viewed as a single customer regardless of that interaction point. And then, of course, we have all of our internal challenges as well, where we're trying to respond to that uh, regulatory pressure and we're trying to respond to that change in customer demands by creating internal systems to view the customer holistically and creating internal processes to create transparency and demonstrate uh, compliance to the regulators. We're also faced with things like moving to the cloud and trying to understand what does that mean to us as an organization when our data is shifting to outside of our control to a certain extent, outside of our firewalls, and somebody else is managing our data. And at the same time, these volumes are increasing significantly. Regardless of which industry you're in, there's more and more information that is being given to you by your customers and your prospects, and there's more and more information that's being created by your products and services. So there's a lot of things happening internally, and then the last thing that I always like to point out on this slide is that internally we tend to react to these pressures in a line of business way. So we react to regulatory compliance uh, or regulatory pressures through our compliance organization, or we react to customer demands through our marketing organization, and we create projects within that compliance organization or within that marketing organization to address that need. 
Well, as it turns out, those isolated projects actually just make things worse because the data that is used by the marketing organization is the same data generally that's used by that compliance organization. So this line of business thinking, this line of business funding and activity actually creates greater demand for governance and governance can in fact help smooth over that project-oriented approach to addressing issues and opportunities. But of course, that starts to create change when we're looking at shifting that focus from line of business to uh, enterprise-wide. There we go. So therefore, so how do we make this successful and how do we make this sustainable? Well, the biggest thing is motivation. So do people understand why we're doing this? Are we able to measure the impact that we're having uh, to address those business drivers? So do we have good metrics behind it? And have we made a strong business case for uh, data governance and for data governance change management? So really what it comes down to a lot of times is making, helping the organization as well as the individuals within that organization understand um, why we're doing this and what is the importance, what's the importance to the business in terms of the business's sustainability and importance to the individual participants within the business to make sure that their, uh, their jobs and the, and the operational focus of the business is smooth and is efficient and productive. So some of the things to think about in terms of the critical success factors are making sure that those business drivers are well understood and to be proactive about it. So thinking about change management from a realistic perspective. So the next section, Pam's going to go through a process for change management, and she'll walk through some steps to make it very clear and realistic and to make it proactive so that the organizational issues are identified and planned for and that the implementation, which is generally done in a project format, is actually incorporating those best practices around change. So to sum up this section, data governance means change. Most organizations didn't, did not create their company with a data governance mindset. And as a result, anytime you look to govern your data better, that ultimately means change to your organization. And it may mean big changes or it may mean small changes, but the reality is, is that there will be changes and so that needs to be planned for and it needs to be understood in order to be effective. And changing that culture means changing the way that people think and behave. And this is one of the things that I think we deny because it's very, very difficult. So in this next section, Pam's going to talk about an organized and systematic way of approaching change so that it doesn't seem so difficult and so daunting. And over to you, Pam. Okay, thank you very much, Kelly. Um, I thought it might be useful. You know, we talk a lot about this um, need to manage change, and I, I know that uh, sometimes people kind of roll their eyes back in their heads and think, you know, why do we have to worry about this stuff? Well, there's, there are some very good reasons for it, um, particularly when you're asking people to think and behave differently, as Kelly referred to just now. People, that that causes people to kind of sit up straight and go, wait a minute, um, I'm used to doing my job this way, and now you're asking me to do it that way, and I'm not sure I like that. And so it's very, very important to have a way to help people understand why it's not such a big deal, why it's not um, going to hurt them, and why, uh, why it's important for the company um, and the company's future for them to make those changes. People resist change because it's not familiar to them. So helping folks get familiar with what you want them to do, making sure that you're giving them the information and the training they need to be successful um, is really, um, uh, really uh, very critical to your success um, in implementing data governance. And uh, this chart, sort of highlights what I'm talking about here. There, there are two sides to managing change. There's no, no question about it. There's the situational piece where you've changed a process and maybe you've changed the participants in that process 
and you need to explain to people that you used to do your process this way, but now you need to do it a different way. And I make the comment here about it being relatively easy to plan for and anticipate. It is because, because you know what the change needs to be and you can build the training around that and so forth. But the flip side of change is the psychological aspect, and there really is the psychological aspect to change. You're, you're asking people to reorient how they do things, and many times folks struggle with that. Um, I can tell you myself that the furniture in my living room has been arranged in one way for a long, long time because I'm not, although I'm pretty good at telling other people how to manage change, I'm not so good at doing it myself. So. I understand the discomfort that people have with making things, uh, with doing things differently. So you have to pe help people let go of the old situation and get comfortable with a new way of doing things. And you do that through communication and training you, um, and some other factors that we're going to cover in uh, the upcoming process. The other thing to remember is that everybody, and I mean every individual, um, processes change at a different rate. Some people get to it immediately. Um, some people, it takes a long time. So you can't necessarily say we're implementing June 30th and have everybody on the bandwagon with you. It may take folks a little, <coughs> excuse me, longer uh, uh, to catch up with you than you might have anticipated. And, and of course, to, for change to be successful, you have to you have to address both sides of these. You can't just do the situational without recognizing that you uh, you have the psychological aspect to deal with. Okay, Kelly? Um, here's, uh, I thought it, this might be useful, is a communication framework. This is courtesy of uh, William Bridges, who wrote, wrote a great book on how to get people through change called Managing Transitions. Um, it's a short, practical approach, um, and I highly recommend it. But this framework, he calls it the four Ps, uh, purpose, picture, plan, and participation. And it's a tremendously good per, um, communication framework. Think about this when you're putting communication together. Think about this when you are uh, trying to uh, create a picture for people of how it's going to be in the future. Um, make sure that you look for opportunities to get engage people in the process. Um, I know with data governance, sometimes uh, people think that maybe there's a, there's the experts over here that need to, <clears throat> excuse me, establish the plan and lay out the framework and roll out the framework, but there's always ways to get a broader population of your stakeholders engaged, like um, simply asking for feedback or simply asking what's working and what isn't, and then showing people that you listened to them, very key showing people that you listen to them and implementing some of their suggestions. You can engage people very easily um, uh, to support what you're trying to do as opposed to resist what you're trying to do. So the, um, so you always want to be able to explain why you're doing something. Kelly alluded to this earlier. Um, make sure that you can explain why this is a good thing for the business and what problems you're trying to solve, et cetera. Paint a picture of how it's going to look and feel um, in the future once data governance is implemented. Make sure you have that picture and can explain it to people. Very, very important to help people get through um, that famous change curve that we talk about where you kind of bottom out and then start to uh, climb up the other side. But if people have an idea of what uh, they're heading for and they can understand how it's going to be different, um, that really helps people adopt uh, change much more quickly. Um, the plan, it's always important to communicate the plan, um, let people know when they're going to receive information and training and so on. One of the, of the critical aspects here is, you know, plans, plans are plans, plans change. So make sure you're communicating the changes to those plans as well. <clears throat> the other thing is in your stakeholder groups, Make sure you're engaging the managers to be able to explain to their folks how things are going to change for them. Um, that engages those managers in the processes and helps you build their support as well. Okay, Kelly. Um, Kelly alluded to the process earlier. I use a very simple process, three phases, planning, managing, implementing, and sustaining change. 
Um, earlier I alluded to the information, collecting information early so that you understand what issues you're likely to uh, run up against and you can build your plan for addressing those issues. So in the planning phase, and, I'm, and as I'm going through this, I'm really wondering if I should, Kelly, can you go to the next slide? Um, this slide, we, we did an alignment to, to the phases of data governance. So I'll use this to explain what I would have used the prior slide to explain, and I apologize to everybody for that. But I think this makes the point uh, a little bit better. The, um, uh, we have these phases that we go through where you're, you're anticipating the changes that are coming, and then you, you help the organization through those changes, and then um, implementation rollout occurs, and you're concerned about making sure you can sustain change, which to me means you make things stick. <clears throat> the, the, one of the good things about this slide is it lays it, you, you can see we don't wait till we're done to start telling people what's happening, to start training, um, to help engaging people in the process. You want to start as early as possible with, with your data governance efforts. So you build your, your project plan really contains all the steps required to manage the changes that you're going to run up against. When you're planning for change, you want to know what to anticipate. Um, I'm a big fan of using a change readiness survey. It asks a few questions, less, usually around less than 30, but it helps you gauge where your issues are likely to be. Um, do you have issues with your leadership? You know, do people not believe um, the leaders tell them the truth, which happens a lot in organizations? If so, then you've got a trust issue to overcome, and you have to, um, uh, be able to make sure that your leaders are aligned around what you're trying to do. Again, this is often not the case. Either some of your leadership's not educated about what you're trying to do or they don't believe in it. It can be any of those, but you want to make sure you've identified those issues early. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you also start building your communication plan. Um, again, you communicate as early as possible what's happening. You start to explain the whys. You start to start to paint the picture, tell people kind of what to expect over the next few months, and so forth. Um, in the managing change phase, really, you're uh, continuing to check in on your leadership to make sure that they're aligned. Um, you start to build some metrics around adoption. How are you going to know that data governance is taking, <laughs> so to speak? Um, and you want to also do an impact analysis on your organization. It does, do structures need to change? Do jobs need to change? I think uh, many times data governance results in new roles in the organization. How are you going to train those folks? How are you going to select those folks? How are you going to train them and so forth? Um, so that type of analysis takes place as you're getting a better handle on what the impacts are likely to be. In the sustaining phase, that's really where uh, you turn the um, uh, you turn the data governance um, over to uh, the organization. You have your data stewards in place. Potentially, you have your data owners in place. These folks are now trained, and um, they have their engagement model and their processes and their policies and standards that have been rolled out, and now you want to start assessing how well that rollout is going. Um, I, I would highly recommend doing follow-up, <coughs> excuse me, follow-up uh, reviews with people, um, to interviews, uh, check-ins, health surveys, whatever works in your organization to see, you know, how folks are progressing with the changes they need to progress with, where are the issue areas, where do you need to adjust your, your plan, and so forth. Okay, Kelly? Um, in the tutorial that Kelly and I are going to do in um, uh, Washington in a few weeks, <clears throat> we're actually going to look at about uh, 10 different factors, but in the interest of time here, um, we picked four that we thought would be of interest to the group. Um, so, so join us. <laughs> Another shame, shameless plug, but join us in uh, Washington for the, uh, the the big tutorial. Um, we're going to go through some uh, discussion of executive sponsorship, 
Um, we're going to talk a little bit about getting your leadership aligned. Uh, we're going to cover um, communication, and again, I think I mentioned this already. This is the early, early and often approach, and then talk about engaging stakeholders. And Kelly, please uh, feel free to chime in any time along the way here. <clears throat> okay. So let's go to. Will do. Let's go. To, thanks. Let's go to sponsorship. Um, there's an organization out there that. Uh, you may be interested, if you, if you want to learn more about managing change and some of the best practices around managing change, there's an organization called ProSci. And their website is www.changemanagement-management.com. Um, ProSci does best practices studies every couple of years, and they, um, they have identified in their studies since the late 90s that executive sponsorship is considered the number one critical success factor for successful change. So I point that out to say executive sponsorship of your data governance initiative is, a, is very critical and getting the right executive sponsor, someone who understands what you're trying to do, who uh, believes in it and supports it, who can engage other leaders, who can help you um, when there's issues with resources or um, uh, resistance, very important to find, and I would recommend someone from the business um, as, as a, a strong executive sponsor. It certainly helps in the alignment that you need to do with the business around governance. <clears throat> One of the things to do when, when you have your executive sponsor uh, identified is, is talk to them about their level of comfort with leading a change initiative. It's important that they understand the role and what you need from them. So think about what you need from them in terms of their support and in, uh, engage them. There's a, a tool, and um, I've uh, got a, an example of it on the next slide. It's very simple. It's, it's, it's to put together a roadmap, and it really identifies um, the key activities and responsibilities that you want of the sponsor. Um, it helps uh, identify actions needed to build um, support of all those changes you're trying to make, and, and it really helps engage other levels of leadership. Um, and this is something, this little tool is something you should review often. You're, you're going to lay out a series of activities. A lot of them are communication events, um, and you want to make sure that those get updated in light of the progress that you're making with your initiative. So on the next slide, there's uh, an example, I believe. Yes, there it is. Very um, simple. Um, you, the audiences for your sponsor are really the program and project teams. So if there are project teams engaged in your data governance effort, um, then you want the sponsor to be talking to them as well, that he can go to, he or she can go to team meetings, there can be one-on-one -on -one discussions set up. You can address the communication however you need to, but that's one area of engagement for your sponsor. One of the big areas is leadership, as, as I alluded to before, and that's what are the actions you need your sponsor to take with other leaders and managers to make sure that you get the support for data governance that you need. And you can use, um, uh, there. You can do a little assessment with your sponsor of all the managers and, and leaders impacted by data governance, and it's a very simple red, yellow, green type of exercise. Who's, you know, green is a support, yellow where they're on the fence, and um, red where there's resistance, and then ask your sponsor for support in helping win over those managers or leaders who are not supporting you. Again, this is, a, this is a, sort of a, an ongoing exercise. Um, and engaging leaders, having your sponsor engage leaders in the um, um, uh, effort uh, to support data governance is, um, is really critical, I think, to your success. And then the broader associates that are impacted by data governance, these can include your data stewards, your data sponsors, uh, sorry, data owners, and so forth. I mean, they should be, um, uh, engaging with uh, the sponsor on a regular basis. Um, there's things like uh, if your company does things like quarterly results meetings, town hall meetings, um, 
there can be if your if your data spot, uh, data stewards and owners come together in working group type situations, having your sponsor um, discuss with them the progress they're making, the issues they're having, and then um, engaging his or her support is really uh, really critical. Pam, can I can I add to this? Oh, please do. So I think this is really important, and I think one of the things as uh, data governance practitioners, sometimes we're shy to uh, direct our executive sponsors because they might be two or three steps above us in the hierarchy. But the guidance here is they're probably looking for some direction. They're probably wanting to, to know what you want them to say, and putting together a plan like this and uh, constantly updating and communicating that sponsor with what they should be saying is in fact helpful for that sponsor. Um, if you don't tell them what you want them to say, guess what, they're going to say something else. And so if they miss set expectations for a program that you're responsible for delivering, that's kind of frightening. So I think that this is really great guidance and so, you know, don't be shy about um, recommending and coaching your sponsor in any other way that you would coach someone who is more junior to you in the organization because they want the content. They, they're so busy, they don't want to be making it up on their own. So anyway, back to you, Pam. Great, thank you, Kelly. That was a, a great input. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, moving along to the next um, topic is leadership alignment, and I had somebody ask me the other day, alignment to what? It's, uh, it's really, in this context, the, the term alignment means do they uh, support and agree that data governance is the direction that the organization needs to go? Um, why do we care about leadership alignment? Because it's another one of those critical success factors that has been validated by the ProSci studies. Um, is one reason to do it. If your leadership's not aligned, then inconsistent messaging is getting out there. Um, resistance um, is often uh, a result, and resistance to what you're trying to do is, is make sure life's difficult um, as you're trying to roll out your program. So it's, it's important, I think, to take some time to assess how the leaders impacted by your uh, initiative data governance, where the disconnects might be, and then take some steps, and here's where your sponsor can be a big help, take your steps to help address those disconnects. Um, this is not a one-shot deal. I think it's important to do this periodically throughout your initiative um, to make sure that, because you may, be, you may be rolling out in stages, and so you may affect one set of leadership and then move to another set as, uh, as the initiative grows. Um, so it's important to keep an eye on those folks in leadership positions that are impacted, how they could potentially derail what you're trying to do and make sure that they understand what you're trying to do and support you. Um, and again, your sponsor is, executive sponsor is a great um, ally in this endeavor. So, uh, I've included a little example, again, um, use whatever works for you, but I, I have used these types of questions in an interview type of format uh, or a survey type of format to get folks' reaction to uh, data governance, to um, uh, major issues they may see to successfully implement, et cetera, and you can compare and contrast responses, identify your gaps and disconnects and then put together a plan to get those addressed. Kelly, anything to add there? No, nope, I think that's great. Okay. Communication, um, and I, I think communication is, again, one of the most critical things to do, um, and, and I'm a believer in starting as early as possible in the process. Um, one of the things to do is create an identity uh, a story around your data governance initiative, something that you feel the organization could uh, recognize and grab onto. And then build some repeatable key messaging around it and uh, repeat those messages often. Um, the research shows it take, can take up to 10 times for people to really grasp what you're trying to do. 
<clears throat> it's important to customize those messages by the stakeholders that you've got um, because you may need different messages for different groups. And then do test periodically to see if your messaging is getting across. Uh, you can do that in the form of a survey. Some organizations have a capability on their internal website to do a little pulse surveys. Perhaps you could use a technique like that. Uh, do a quick check-in, um, you know, sort of uh, interview a few people here and there to see, you know, are they understanding what you're trying to say, what, how could you do it differently, and so forth. I included in the, the deck here an example of a communication plan. It's just a big old spreadsheet, but it is a great way to track the kinds of events that you're trying to, um, to use to get your messaging out. Uh, what messages you want to get out in, and in what events and, uh, and so forth. So I recommend using a tool like this to track what you're doing and to track what you've done. It's, um, it's good reference. And for those of you that are in larger organizations, this is a great opportunity to get an internal communications group involved, maybe an internal marketing organization, and of course, those people that provide other sorts of training and awareness within the company and getting them on board so that you're not doing all of this by yourself. Great point. Okay, I think we're on to stakeholders. Great. Yes. So to wrap up our fourth point, uh, the fourth point is to really understand and leverage those stakeholders that you have uh, within the organization. So being able to understand who will be impacted by the data governance program and assess uh, what the change might mean to them. So what might they do when they understand that their role might shift slightly, uh, that the processes that they're using, uh, that the uh, individuals within the organization that they need to communicate with might be different, and what sort of issues and concerns might arise out of that recommended change in process. And so understanding that early on, regardless of their hierarchy within the organization, is really important. Because the more that you can anticipate what the reaction to change might be, the more that you can plan on it. And the other thing when you're doing a stakeholder analysis is to just understand in a broad spectrum uh, the the group of the, the individuals as well as the departments within the company uh, that will be impacted by the change. And one of the things that we do is put this into kind of a little quadrant, so we're a consulting company, so we use quadrants. I mean, what is a presentation without a quadrant from a consulting company? So it's almost over, so it came up at the very end. But anyway, um, by understanding where the stakeholders fit on this quadrant, and it can help you determine what's the best way to engage those different stakeholders. And you can think about this as groups or departments within an organization, or you can also think about them as individuals. And understanding where the individuals and the groups lie on this quadrant can help you understand uh, what their potential reaction could be, and therefore how much time and effort you want to uh, apply to them and to apply to working with them through that um, uh, communication plan process through that leadership alignment process and through that executive sponsorship process. Because the reality is, is you do only have 24 hours in a day, right? And, you know, hopefully we do actually sleep and go home and things like that. So we do need to prioritize. So I'm not saying that, that, that there's, that, that people fall into the not, you know, the, the do not address category, but when you're working through your communication plan and your ability to respond, you do have to prioritize. So what you do is by looking at those people who are very influential, but may not necessarily have a, uh, a big interest in your organization, understanding how you can actually meet their needs so that they can talk positively about the data governance program because chances are people that are in that meet your needs quadrant based on their level of influence have a link or an influence on that key player quadrant. And so those are people who are colleagues within the organization. And you want to make sure that the people that are in that upper left quadrant support your program. They may not be as tightly in 
involved as someone who's in a key player quadrant, but at least they're not speaking negatively of the program. So you want to make sure that that level is addressed. And at the same time, those people who may not be influential in the organization, but they're highly interested or they're impacted by uh, by the data governance program, you want to make sure you're showing them a lot of consideration and supporting their interests so that they become really your evangelists uh, around the, the company and they're the people who are talking highly about the positive impact of the data governance program, what have you. Another way to think about this is engaging your stakeholders within your organizational or your operating model. So thinking about who is on that stakeholder map, where they fall on the quadrant, and where you want them involved within your operating model. So the idea is you want to have the key players as part of your steering committee, because those are the executives who are going to be the ambassadors and the evangelists within the organization. You also want to make sure that you've got someone who's a key player involved in that, uh, you know, call it what you will, but it's a data governance office. So whoever's responsible for the execution of the program. Uh, it's important to have a key player there so that you've got someone who has a level of influence within uh, the organization. Uh, and they can, in fact, uh, help to influence those steering committee members as well. And then, of course, when you're looking at the data governance and working group, it's nice to have the key players there as well, but most definitely you want those interested stakeholders so that you have people who will be willing to participate on, a, on an ongoing basis so that those members of your working group are in fact working and that they are uh, positively involved and they are proactively uh, participating in order to improve how data is governed within the organization. So by understanding who your stakeholders are, where they fit on the quadrant, you can also take advantage of them uh, in the, or take advantage of their roles within your operating model. And with that, uh, I think that's the, the last slide that we've got. So wanted to see if there's any questions. We've got about nine minutes left and we're happy to entertain any questions that we that we can from the audience. Pam, was there anything else you wanted to add? No, nope. uh, ready for questions if, if there are some. Oh, most definitely. Our attendees are great and uh, getting involved in everything that we do, which we just love. And of course, the most common question is a, a question about receiving a copy of the slides and the recording. And just to remind everyone, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday with links to the slides and links to the recording and anything else requested through the uh, requested, that was requested, and Kelly sent some links and stuff, so I'll make sure and get those out. Kelly has also offered, Kelly, both Kelly and Pam have offered to write up some answers to questions, so keep those questions coming in. If we don't have time to get to them during the webinar, we will get you answers in that follow-up email. So let's dive in. Uh, so Kelly and Pam, we are, the this is a comment coming in from David. We are struggling a lot with the decentralized approach to material master data. There's a 350-page guidebook, but too many people involved who feel they don't own it. They want to re-centralize it. Thoughts on that? Uh, start planning your change management initiative. <laughs> uh, Seriously, I don't, I don't mean to um, make light of it, but anytime you're going from a distributed to a centralized model, that is the most change that is going to occur. And if you don't think about it in a programmatic way, it will, uh, it will get on top of you very quickly. And so uh, just like any other aspect of a program, that change component should be proactively and very specifically planned for uh, in your program. Um, Pam, do you want to comment on that too? That's, uh, yeah, that's a very tough situation. And I think that speaks to um, if there's an opportunity to engage one of your senior executives as a sponsor for this, someone who supports the idea of bringing it together and can lay out expectations for the organization around around what they need to do to A, make it happen, and B, you know, make it work after the fact. 
um, that would be um, my number one recommendation or a starting point at least is consider if you're able to engage one of your senior executives to uh, help you in this regard. Yep, most definitely. Great, and the next question is, or the next couple of questions uh, I, I, is asking about the size of your governance team for each of your organizations and how long did it take you to set it up? Although as consultants, um, you're really setting up other companies' organizations. So really, you know, what's the average size team that you see, uh, core team for each company that you set up, and how long does it take to set up uh, those teams within the companies? Wow, boy, is that a how long is a piece of string type of answer that you're going to get. Um, but anyway, I think uh, uh, the size of the team is directly proportional to the size of the company and the amount of data that you have. So the smaller companies are going to have smaller teams. The broader companies are going to have broader teams. And it also is uh, impacted by um, how distributed your organization is. So the question that came previously, if it's a highly distributed organization anyway, sometimes trying to centralize or to identify a few select people who have 100% accountability for the data is a very hard thing to do. So what you end up with is consistency of roles across an organization where you may have a broad virtual team that has accountability as it pertains to data and they're clear about their role in governance across the organization, but you may not have a lot of full-time people on the governance uh, within that governance office. So it really depends on just dis uh, distributed nature of the business versus how much you want to centralize. And the other thing I would say is to think about it as an incremental and an iterative process where you may want to start with just a couple of people or a couple of roles and as demand increases and as you're able to demonstrate value, then you can expand the size of the organization as you are starting to work on more and more data elements, data domains and what have you. So um, it's really hard to give a, a black and white answer from that perspective. Is there anything additional, Pam, that you want to add? Uh, no, I think Kelly covered it. All right. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it, right along those same lines, the next question is really, you know, how much upfront, upfront time to prep and set up prior to data quality program rollout is required and the number of individuals involved in these setup activities? Oh, again, that's kind of a tough one, not understanding the size of the organization or the amount of data or what have you. Um, you know, I think the one thing is you don't want to be spending too much time planning before you start executing uh, because you don't want to fall into the analysis paralysis and you don't want those stakeholders or executive sponsors to lose interest. So you want to make sure that you are doing adequate planning and that you are going through the process to create that plan, but at the same time, you're also starting to incrementally show some value. So the planning process can last, you know, two months, three months, you know, four months, that sort of thing, but you don't want to be spending six months to a year planning. You want to find, you want to identify places where you're starting to uh, engage and implement. And that might be as easy as your communication plan where you've started to identify uh, what you're trying to accomplish with governance and therefore you're starting to clarify, articulate your business drivers and create that picture as Pam was saying. And so you may start implementing your communication before you even start implementing true governance around creation of policies and what have you. Um, Pam, did you wanna add anything to that? No, I think you covered it nicely, but that is, that is indeed a great um, place to start and it also starts to engage others in what you're trying to get accomplished um, and, sh and as you said, show, show progress and, and some value. Well, I'm afraid that is all we have time for today, but Pam and Kelly, thank you so much for this fabulous presentation. I look forward to seeing you in DC at the end of the month, less than two weeks away. Um, thank you. 
<laughs> so, uh, and again, just a reminder to everyone, I'll have a follow-up email out by the end of the day Thursday with links to the slides and the recording and uh, answers to the questions for you. Uh, so if you don't get that in your inbox by the time you walk in on Friday, let me know. And I hope to see everyone in D.C. at the end of the month. And if you're registered and you're going to be attending, make sure you stop by and see Pam and Kelly's full presentation and workshop on this uh, for further information. So I hope everyone has a great day. And again, Pam and Kelly, thank you so much for, for doing this for us today, and, and uh, we will see you soon. Thank, thank you. you.